This video is brought to you by Tokyo Treat and Sakurako. Hello Noble Ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and today we are responding to a video published by the channel Weird History. You will find a link in the description below. The video is called What Life Was Like as a Samurai in Feudal Japan. The video has got currently 2.1 million views and it was posted two years ago. As always I'd like to underline that this is a friendly response video, uh, I'm not attacking the channel nor the creator but there are a few things that were said on this video that I believe need addressing. Let's get started. The samurai warrior of feudal Japan has been a pop culture staple for decades. Brave, disciplined, skillful, and above all, honorable samurai have appeared as the heroes of beloved films, novels, television shows, and even comic books. But as is often the case, the reality is way more complex and way more interesting than the fiction. So far, I agree with everything. The word samurai is derived from the Japanese word subaru, which means to serve. Uh, actually, no, that's the brand of a car. Let me say this right off the bat, I'm not going to correct every single word that he mispronounces because he clearly, he doesn't know Japanese, which is not a crime, and besides, he's speaking English. So even though later on in the video you'll see that he pronounces the Japanese rice wine as sake, whereas the Japanese pronounce it sake, it's fine. I mean, at the end of the day, he's speaking English. It would be on reverse, the same as the Japanese saying makdonarudo when they're trying to say McDonald's. So when it comes to like correcting his pronunciation, I'm not gonna correct his pronunciation. In this case, however, I do need to correct him because this is not a matter of he's mispronouncing the word uh, because he's pronouncing it the English way. He literally said Subaru and it's instead Saburau. So the classical Japanese verb that meant to serve, no one uses it anymore, but that would have been this one. Both the word and the warrior class that it describes came into being around the 8th century, or what's known as Japan's Heian period. For comparison, this was roughly the same time knights were going on crusades over in Europe. The 8th century is actually a bit too early when talking about crusades in Europe because the first official crusade happened in August 1096. And even if we don't consider the first official crusade and we want to talk about the People's Crusade, so the sort of unofficial crusade that happened before the official one endorsed by the Catholic Church, then we are still in 1096. It just it happened, if I recall correctly, in April. So 8th century, definitely too early. For talking about the crusades so it's kind of weird that he would that he would say that if you were going to be a samurai you needed to start young how young well one famous spiritual guide from the medieval era recommended encouraging bravery from the time of infancy oh, gosh. children who were part of the samurai class could start learning the basics of fencing with wooden swords as early as three years old yeah you heard that right three and while modern society requires you to be 18 to see an R-rated movie, medieval samurai kids would be fighting with real, lethal blades by the time they were five. No, they wouldn't be fighting with real-life blades by the time they were five. This is clearly sensationalism. So basically what happened here is that they read that they started training very young, and therefore they said, oh, they, they started fighting by the time they were five. Absolutely not. Also because training with live blades doesn't equal to fighting with live blades because fighting with live blades as a form of training is stupid even for adults so never mind children giving a live blade to a child actually still happens today in japan i, I don't want to say names and i don't want to point out dojo but i do know of a person who is a very high up when it comes to dojo martial arts and he gave a live blade to his son and his son is like super young but definitely it's not having him fight with it. It's mostly for like kata, for training, for test cutting. So yes, maybe they did do it for test cutting. It wouldn't surprise me since people still do it today. But saying that they had five-year-olds fight with live blades is literally trying to change the facts in order to surprise your audience and make them go, oh my gosh. But it is spreading false information. Now, not only I have a problem when it comes to this section with the part where they say that children by the time they were five were already fighting with lethal blades, we have debunked that, but I also have a problem with the very statement, modern society requires you to be 18 to watch an R-rated movie, and these people had children fight with lethal blades. I think it's very unfair, and I will tell you more about it after a word from our sponsor. Now check this out, today we've got boxes from Japan, one from Tokyo Treat and one from Sakurako. Tokyo Treat is a monthly Japanese snack subscription box. Join in celebrating Japan's harvest holiday and munch on up to 20 seasonal and exclusive Japanese snacks inspired by its kimi such as the salt lemon Kit Kat, maneken strawberry waffle and the orange mikan mochi. 
Sakura Ko is a monthly Japanese snack subscription box. You will receive 20 traditional and authentic artisan Japanese snack items, including Japanese teas and one special Japanese tableware with your box every month. Partnering with the local Kyoto government, you can experience the cultural and culinary rich snacks of Kyoto, the birthplace of Tsukimi celebration in Japan. All snacks pair excellent with Gion Tsujiri Hojicha tea in this month's box. Tsukimi is a really cool activity that people do in Japan. I remember when I was living in Japan, I used to do that. So I'm really excited. Let's check out and taste some of these amazing snacks. I'm going to start with Tokyo Treat because this one is my favorite, while Sakurako is my wife's favorite. And right off the bat, we've got Salt Lemon Kit Kat. I'm having this one. Goodness gracious, what is it with Japanese Kit Kat? This is amazing. Plus, I'm Sicilian. I love lemon. Hello Kitty themed Mirukupan, so milk bread. There you go, Hello Kitty milk bread. Oh, thank you. Look how cute, it's a little star. They're very good. Very nice. Mm. Let's see now what Sakurako has to offer. If you like traditional Japan, this is the one for you. We've got some roasted tea, so let's go make tea and then we're gonna have one of these biscuits. Winston. Here we are. Add a little biscuit. This is my therapy right here. If you love Japan and Japanese culture, you should totally check out and try Sakurako and Tokyo Treat Boxes yourself. And by using the link in the description below, you will also be supporting my channel. And by using my special code METATRON, you will also earn a $5 off from your first order. And thank you very much to Tokyo Treat and Sakurako for sponsoring my video. Modern society requires you to be 18 to see an R-rated movie. Medieval samurai kids would be fighting with real lethal blades by the time they were five. This statement, I have to say, really drives me nuts because it's very hypocritical and disingenuous. What he's basically saying is, oh, look at these feudal medieval, as he says, Japanese people giving life blades to children. And yet he forgets that those are not just children. Those are professional warriors in training. But the part that really puts me off is his statement modern society doesn't even allow you to watch an R-rated movie until you're 18 and these people gave blades to children. This is the typical superiority complex that modern society needs to have towards medieval society. The reason why I say it's hypocritical is because the very same modern society, depending on where you're from, allows parents to take their kids to a range to teach them how to use GUNs. So, if a samurai were to come to our time and we were to tell him, oh my gosh, you people gave weapons to children, or they could say, but so do you. And besides, those are not even warriors in training. Now, regardless of your political view, whether you agree or not, we have to be honest and not hypocritical when we describe a society of the past without pretending to be better than them, particularly when we do very similar things. When it came to beverages, samurai were allowed to partake in Japan's most widely consumed alcoholic beverage, the rice wine known as sake. Hey, if you had to lay down your life for your boss without hesitation, you might want a stiff drink too. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Being a skilled warrior in feudal Japan required expert level knowledge of martial arts and weaponry. Samurai always fought with blades of various types, but their arsenal still evolved over time. Early samurai preferred fighting with spears. Yes. Medieval samurai, who mostly traveled on horseback, were partial to bows and arrows. The famous samurai sword, called a katana, mm. became popular during the Kamakura period. Along with the bow, it would remain the samurai's predominant tool well into the 15th century. It's not predominant, it never was predominant. It was always present, as I say, although in different forms, because before the katana or the uchi katana was devised, they used tachi, as I was saying, so longer blades, um, but it never was predominant. It never was a main weapon. The bow and arrow was a main weapon, the spear was a main weapon, and also as gunpowder arrives, then they start using tanegashima teppo, matchlock type arquebus, so that becomes a primary weapon weapon, particularly for gunner units, but um, never the sword. The sword is never a predominant weapon. It's always a backup weapon. Samurai were powerful and respected, but technically they were not nobility. Under medieval Japan's rigid caste system, the samurai were part of a special military class that was treated more like merchants. This meant they faced many of the same financial challenges as merchants. And okay, so this I have a big problem with, because first of all, when you say 
The samurai, they were respected, but they were not nobility. The meaning of the words nobility slash aristocracy changes so much in the history of Japan that it's really, really complicated to describe it accurately with very few words. It changes during the Heian period, it changes during the Bakuhu Sengoku period, major restoration, there are changes in 1884, there are changes in 1947. But still, even if we decide to paint with a very broad brush, saying that because technically there weren't an ability to face challenges that merchants did face is in fact incorrect. The video is mostly focusing on the period called Bakufu, and in this time nobles had zero power. Everything was in the hands of the military. And even though when it comes to the daimyo, so the great names, the feudal lord, yes, some did derive or had some connection to the so-called kuge or the actual court nobles, others didn't. But they still had more power than the actual nobles who were relegated to Kyoto, including the emperor who at the time of the shogunate had only nominal power. It was the shogun that was in power. This meant they faced many of the same financial challenges as merchants. Well, honestly, they weren't treated as merchants at all. I mean, when you look at the full pyramid of Japanese feudal society, you see the merchants are pretty low. A peasants, technically, technically, I understand that and a lot of merchants had a lot of money, so they probably lived better and didn't care that they were underneath peasants, but still technically peasants produce something, merchants don't. They just sell something that is produced by someone else, which is why they are lower. But as you can see, there's a gap between the bushi, the samurai, and the merchants, so they definitely were not in the same position. Now, given when you say they had the same economical or financial struggles as the merchants, that also confuses me, because a samurai is not selling stuff, so a samurai is, well, yeah, he's selling his services, I guess, but a samurai, we, we could even say that a merchant has customers and a samurai has clients, maybe you can look at it this way, but a samurai makes money in a completely different way, a samurai will go into battle, it will be paid for it, he will participate to some spoils, he will be rewarded depending on what they do, it's a completely different system on how to make money, and therefore, yes, you, you, you of course had samurai that struggled, you had samurai that were wearing armor made of paper because they couldn't afford the iron armor, and they were, you had samurai that didn't have many retainers, you had samurai that had a lot of retainers, you had samurai that owned land, you had half samurai, there is a lot to say. Uh, so of course the variables when it comes to how rich or how poor a samurai was would really vary, although then again if it's a samurai that can still wear full armor, I'm not sure that I would say that he's really struggling when it comes to money, he's probably just struggling compared to richer or more successful uh, samurai or older samurai who are veterans. But a merchant, a merchant struggles when he doesn't sell, a merchant struggles when the taxes are raised, the merchant struggles when there are blockades on when there is war because of obvious reasons I don't need to go into but they are so different and distinct that it really surprises me but let's see what else he says while Zen Buddhism didn't arrive until the 12th century Japan had known of Buddhism in general since the 6th century with heavy restrictions on the cultivation of birds and animals for food the religion led the country to embrace a diet heavy in fruits, vegetables and grains, especially rice. Yes, but not everyone accepted that and not everyone actually followed these rules also. These rules change. Th this is a massive topic. In fact, I'll have, you know, food in ancient Japan. I do have a, a one video here if you're interested. That one is mostly just the entire video just to talk about rice, the influence of Buddhism into uh, everyday life. Uh, suffice to say that the government even changed its mind several times. Sometimes some things were prohibited, sometimes other things weren't. Then there were, of course, poachers, there were people that were still hunting even though they weren't supposed to. So it's not as simple as Buddhism decided you should be all vegetarians and the government en enacted it and then everybody followed it. As noted previously, samurai often struggled economically. This, in addition to their strict moral code, made them frugal eaters. Yeah, so here they, I see the, the kanji, they're, they're having bushido, but bushido in the 12th century wasn't coded. It wasn't organized. There was nothing. I mean, yes, they had their own laws and regulations. They had their own code, probably would vary depending on clan to clan, but it wasn't as codified as they seem to think. While the aristocracy and the military elite dined at banquets that served the finest food and drinks, the samurai, like the peasant, relied on husked rice as a staple. This rice was supposed to be provided as rations by their respective lords. Also, this idea that rice is a staple, meaning that that's basically all people ate, is incorrect. I'm not saying that that's what he's saying necessarily. There is a lot of evidence about the five grain staple instead, meaning that yes, rice was important and 
as he says, it was used also as a, as a form of payment and definitely would have been very common, but it wasn't the only thing that they ate when it comes to carbs. In fact, there were a total of five different grains, as I do speak in details on this video, that were as common in, in, the, in feudal Japan that were consumed by the low class as well as the upper class. So the only thing is, that I'm saying here is not that is necessarily wrong or that they are necessarily wrong, but that they do give this wrong impression that all they had was husked rice, and that's not the case. Going all the way back to the Heian period, samurai armor was extremely flexible. Iron plated with leather or strips of bronze were finely crafted by artisans using advanced tools. As technology continued to develop and new resources became available, samurai armor evolved with it. Over time, the armor became increasingly more elaborate, which had the side effect of increasing its weight. One type of armor, called the yori or oyori, consisted of a multi-part skirt, a kuris, shoulder pads, and a helmet. Altogether, it weighed over 60 pounds. Those samurai helmets, called kabuto, were made from iron and steel. They covered the head and had flaps that provided for protection of the neck. The helmets were carefully sculpted and highly decorated. A daimyo warlord, for example. Okay, so the yoroi, or as it will be later called, oyoroi, is definitely an example of a very, you know, the very heavy end of the spectrum. So I appreciate that they mention that because oftentimes when people talk about samurai armor, they always say, oh, it's so light, it's so flexible, particularly when compared to very heavy medieval European armor and blah, blah, blah. And we know that that's, that's not fair because as you can see, as he rightly said, some, I mean, he said 60, uh, he said 60 pounds, I would say maybe 50. Some examples do, excellent examples do reach 60. That's kind of, again, the heavier end of the spectrum. But yes, the Oyoroi was definitely, I wouldn't say flexible, in fact. <laughs> yeah, anyways, it was very heavy. Uh, but also at the same time as the Oyoroi wasn't used, there were other types of samurai armor which were instead very light. The idea that samurai armor, as it progresses, it becomes heavier and heavier is actually correct. It's just that the forward in time you go, the more options you will have. So yes, if you want, you can wear a full oyoroi, which is going to be super heavy and it's going to hang on your shoulders, but you're going to be mounted anyways. And so some people were like, yeah, I'll do that. I want the full on protection, but other samurai, either because they couldn't afford an oyoroi or simply because they didn't like the idea of wearing something so heavy, they chose other types, like for example, the uh, Domaru, which was a, an armor that would go all around you, it wouldn't have the separate panel like the Oyoroi, it wouldn't be as rigid, it would be much, much lighter, and it would be much preferred for people that fought on foot. But most importantly, uh, I think one, one thing that they didn't say is that even though it does happen that when you look at the development of samurai armor from, for example, the 8th century uh, all the way up to the 12th century, and, and then again, he, he mentions early types of like bronze, but in the Bronze Age there were no samurai, I'd like to underline, so that would be better defined as Japanese armor, Japanese warrior's armor, but not samurai armor because it, it needs to be made for a samurai to be classified as samurai armor. But regardless of that, it's true that when you get to the 12th century, you, one of the options is very heavy, so you get to this option of having the oyoroi, but then as you move forward and enter the Sengoku period, and even earlier the Muromachi period, then the armor starts actually shrinking, getting smaller, getting, I would say, have a better overall weight distribution, such as the set that I have, which which is a Tosei Gusoku, and in that case we have a smaller silhouette, the weight is not on your shoulders but it's on your waist, so where the center of mass is, and, and therefore I think it would have been important to mention then, then the weight that is then cut, and the overall encumbrance of the armor as we reach the 15th century and the 16th century goes down drastically, dramatically. For example, might wear some sort of animal iconography. Apparently, branding has always been important. I, I appreciate the joke. Uh, I, I, I know that he's saying this as a joke, branding. So the elaborate, very weird uh, kabuto with all sorts of decorations that resemble mythical creatures and animals, those are mostly from the Edo period, so the time of peace given. Some really elaborate and very big uh, kabuto with lots of decorations also existed in previous eras, but when you look at stuff like this with lots of different and impressive decorations, he jokingly calls branding, that's mostly from the time of peace when armor was now becoming something that you want to wear just to show off how important and successful and rich you are. It's just that it becomes insane in a good way because I love the kawari kabuto, that's what they're called, uh, in the Edo period because then, you know, artists, it becomes a form of art. There you go, honor.
Over time, the samurai began to develop the famous moral code that would someday become known as Bushido, or the way of the warrior. A samurai's loyalty was to his daimyo and to the shogun, but the code governed his actions. Bushido required its adherents to be brave and honorable in battle, but also in everyday life. This code was standardized under the Kamakura Shogunate in 1232 in a document. I don't actually think it was standardized that early at all. Uh, I think it was standardized again during the period of peace. And uh, so the, the, the way we understand Bushido now, the books that talk about Bushido now, uh, don't really have much to do with 12th century samurai or 13th century samurai. Uh, some of the, of the ideas, like what he said, having been brave and having courage in combat, absolutely. I'm pretty sure that that was something that any professional soldier was expected to do. And if you think about it, I mean, that's something that is expected of you to do from any culture everywhere in the world. If you're a soldier, a professional soldier, you're expected to be professional and to be brave in battle. Um, even in the Roman period, it was like that. So yes, I'm sure that some elements have always been there, but the codification, 1232, I think is too early. Do you think you would have made it as a samurai in feudal Absolutely Japan? Not. <laughs> I would have not made it as a samurai, although I, I think I might do a Chon Mage if I really tried. All right, noble ones, but anyways, I'd like to say hello to Weird History if they do watch this video. It's not, again, an attack on the channel, on the channel but there are, I think, a few things that were uh, perhaps not studied as deeply as they should have been. But anyways, let me, let me know what you think. Definitely go check them out. As always, if you liked this video, consider becoming a noble one and subscribing to my channel for more content from the Metatron. And don't forget the amazing deal that Tokyo Treat and Sakurako have got ready for you. Click the link in the description below to check them out. Thank you very much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread its wings. Goodbye.